Hello, everyone, and welcome to this podcast edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour about my conversation with Lindsay Chervinsky and 10 things about Dolly Madison. We all know something about Dolly Madison, the peacock feathers and the turbans and the fact that she was one million times more vivacious and extroverted than her famous but somewhat doer husband, James Madison. And of course, we tend to know that she saved the Gilbert Stuart painting. And I've always thought that was maybe embellished in some way, but it turns out that the story is more interesting than the cliche. The war comes to America, the War of 1812. Madison gets us through it, let's put it that way, but he doesn't handle it with great heroic style. There's nothing of the hero in James Madison. He's never going to be a man on horseback. Even Jefferson is closer to a man on horseback than than James Madison. But he, you know, he gets us through it, and our Navy really did wonderfully on the Great Lakes, and Andrew Jackson sort of mopped up after it was formerly over in New Orleans, and we wind up feeling pretty good about ourselves, as you would if you survived the juggernaut of the world's most powerful army and navy, but luckily on our home turf. We know that during this this conflict, the British came into the upper Chesapeake to the Potomac, and they, they invaded Washington, D.C., and Washington, D.C. fled away, as you might expect. And Madison was off in Maryland meeting with his own army officers and trying to spur them on to protect uh, the District of Columbia it didn't happen, so the British get off their boats and they come up onto the onto the mall, and they sacked the Capitol and they sacked the Treasury Department and they sacked the White House. And of course, we know that there was a, that the White House was was, was burned and, and and an enormous loss of furniture and uh, and a lot of rebuilding had to occur and it was a near total loss. And the Madisons had had to leave so quickly that. They weren't able to take many things with them, but she did make sure some some important papers were packed in a wagon, to, um, which is re- extraordinarily important. Uh, she she got some of her own effects, but not an enormous number. She she sacrificed her own private property for the for the more important task of of doing what she could to save the government. And she was up on the roof of the White House. I'd never knew that. And she had a spyglass, a telescope, and she was watching the troop movements. And she saw them coming and. People kept saying, you got to go, you got to go, you're running out of time here. And so she was late in getting out, but she wanted to stay just as long as she could. And then she saw the painting. She thought, no way, no way are the British going to wreck that or take that or use that as a war trophy of some sort. And so she wanted to take it with her. And people really were pressing her, you know, this, this is a luxury we do not actually have time to engage in, Mrs. Madison. But she insisted. And it wasn't easy. It's not like you, you you know you lift something that's on a hook and just take it. It was huge for one thing, but also it was screwed to the wall as as, as anything that you value would be in such a place. And so they couldn't really remove it very quickly. They used an axe. They broke up the frame, and then there was kind of an interior frame, and that's too bulky to to carry and too vulnerable. So she used uh, knives, probably not she, but she had it done and cut out the painting from its smaller frame, so some loss of the canvas at at the perimeters. And then she was going to roll it up, and she did roll it after a fashion, but she didn't want to roll it tightly because that would crack the paint and maybe ruin it. But anyway, she finds a way to you know make it portable, and then it's taken in a wagon to Georgetown and spirited away to New York, I think. So she, this is true. This is one of those American mythological stories that turns out to be true and even more interesting in the truth. She was really the first great first lady. She really invented what it is to be the first lady. Of course, Jefferson had not had a wife when he was president because he was a widower. And so she, just as Washington sort of invents what it is to be a president within the confines of the Constitution, so Dolly Madison invents what it is to be a first lady in Washington, D.C. And Abigail Adams was a different character altogether, and and so was Martha Washington. So suddenly we get the idea of the first lady, you know, capital F, capital L, uh, with Dolly Madison. And so all these are things that I've learned in preparing for this series, 10 Things. It's been, it's really been wonderful. You know, you know, you know, you know how it is. You know things, you know, like Mi Lai in Vietnam or Abu Ghraib in Iraq or, you know, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address or, or the Massacre at Wounded Knee or the Battle of the Little Bighorn or you know, John Steinbeck's epic journey in a truck camper, Travels with Charlie. 
we know these things. You know, we have a, this is what's called basic cultural literacy. We know some stuff. If you go any farther than just those kind of headlines and actually ask yourself, well, what what really happened in the in this instance? What are the actual conditions under which Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence? Where was he staying? How did he get his portable writing desk? What books was he consulting? Was he really playing the violin between? Was he really agonizing about not being in contact with his wife, Martha, who was ill and back at Monticello? Did he really um, write it in a single afternoon? And You know, these are all American narratives, American myths. And then you go in and you explore them using the best evidence we have, and that means more recent books because there was a lot of myth writing up until the Cultural Revolution in the United States in the 1960s, and then you know more, and this, this series has really enabled me to do that. And I've learned a great deal from Lindsay. She's been a terrific breath of new, fresh air in the Jefferson Hour and has agreed to take on an even larger role as time goes on. We're thrilled because at some point she'll be drawn into the academic world or be drawn into a more hectic world in which she won't probably have time to give to this program the way she has in the last couple of years, for which I am just immensely grateful. So if you can help us, especially by donating uh, money or property, your ranch, you know, your Airstream, your Airstream, you know you're not using your Airstream trailer. You don't want to get rid of it because nobody does, but you know you're not using it. You could lease it to me. You could sell it to me because my travels around the country for listening to America are going to necessitate that. And, and this would be the greatest enabling gift ever. I mean, I'll mention you every day for the rest of my life, but I need to do that. I've got to find some way to, to airstream my, my wanderings, which are beginning this spring, by the way. They're beginning right now. I'm, this is mid-March, and I'm about to leave for Utah, Arizona, Colorado, uh, at least, and maybe Nevada, to look at water in the West. So if you can help us, do. We need money. We need support. We need your thoughts. We need your comments. We need your criticisms. We need your suggestions of themes that we should pursue or places that we should visit under the guise of listening to America. It's an exciting, really exciting new era in my career and I think in the career of the Thomas Jefferson, which becomes listening to America coming in May. But don't worry. Jefferson will always be with us. Jefferson will always be the center of what we do, because if I'm anything, I'm not an Augustinian, I'm not a Calvinist, I'm not a Democrat or a Republican, I'm not a Libertarian, although I have certain Libertarian fascinations. What am I? I'm a, I'm a child of the Great Plains, I'm a public humanities scholar, I'm a dilettante and amateur, you know, I'm in the old sense of amateur as a lover of, of knowledge. I'm the father of a of a young woman that I think the world of and who has made my life a thousand times more than in any could have been in any other way. But fundamentally, in outlook, I'm a Jeffersonian, by which I mean I do believe that we're up to it. I do believe in the perfectibility of man. I do believe that people can rise to the occasion of governing themselves. I do believe we can be our best selves more often than we think. I do believe we can be rational, that we should see the world through books, that we should get out into nature, that we should have gardens, but we should also camp and hike and, and, and go on wilderness journeys. Uh, I believe that America is an exceptional nation, that to say otherwise is, is just simply not true. I believe that we should shake up our government from time to time, but not in the January 6th way, but in the sort of revising our Constitution. And if I could get anything in the next few years besides the Airstream, besides the Airstream and the ranch, if I could get anything, it would be that the U.S. celebrates the 250th birthday of its founding uh, with a, maybe a non-binding new national uh, constitutional convention, because I'm absolutely certain that the, the Jefferson was right, that you may as well wear the coat that fitted you when you were eight as to try to fit the Constitution of 1787 to the conditions of our time, its opportunities, its challenges, its problems that he was right, that you need periodic, formal restructuring, rewriting, rebooting of your basic way of doing business in a free society. And I think he's been vindicated by the collapse, the effective collapse of our Constitution. So let's go to the show. But thanks for being part of this. I am so delighted that you are. I can't wait to see what listening to America can do as part of the discourse of a country that's in real disarray. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm. 
Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, 10 Things About Dolly Madison. And with me across the country uh, is my friend, Dr. Lindsay Chervinsky. Lindsay, welcome back to the Jefferson Hour. You're much acclaimed by our listeners. Oh, well, thank you for having me back. I'm very excited to talk about Dolly. So we've been doing this 10 Things series now. I think we've done 11 or 12 of them, and they've been really interesting to me. And I learned so much because, you know, we all know something about Dolly Madison, And then if you actually go do some real reading, it just becomes more and more and more fascinating. So born in 1768, died in 1849. Give us just the quickest little biographical sketch of her. So Dolly Madison was technically born in North Carolina, but she considered herself a Virginian. She moved there when she was uh, quite young and grew up on a plantation in Virginia, a slave holding plantation. Her father in 1783 emancipated the enslaved individuals they owned and moved them to Philadelphia. Amazing fact. Amazing amazing fact. fact. Totally amazing fact. They were part of the Quaker community, which was generally abolitionist, but didn't yet require emancipation as as membership requirements. Uh, Moved the family to Philadelphia. She married relatively young, her first husband there, and he died just a couple years later, leaving her. And I, so he died, and also their second son died, leaving her with one young son and by herself with very little family in Philadelphia. Let me just interrupt for a moment to say they died of, in the yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia, which killed off one in 10 Philadelphians. So it was a plague way beyond anything that we've seen in the last few years in the United States. So her first husband and, and one of their children die in the, in the yellow fever epidemic. Yes, a a plague of monumental proportions and truly terrifying because people didn't really understand it. She then went on to marry James Madison, who was, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe 17 years her senior. Correct. uh, Which is not bad. That's not not as bad as it gets. No, it can get much worse. Married to James Madison. I think we'll talk more about the nature of their relationship and how that all worked. And then was his helpmate and his partner in all of the things that he did from running the plantation to uh, serving in Congress to serving as Secretary of State and then President. And she outlived him by some time. She ended up retiring to Washington, D.C., where she was sort of the senior madam is not the right word, but, you know, like the senior sort of woman in town where everyone had to go and get her approval and meet her and uh, had had a pretty extraordinary life, saw a lot of things, lived a lot of places, and by all accounts was wildly remarkable in how she presented herself to the world. And so she served in some ways as a hostess for Jefferson, who was a widower, then for her husband, who was a shy and hypochondriac sort of fellow. So she, for 16 years, was the center of the social scene in the emerging national capital at Washington, D.C., along with Margaret Bayard Smith, the wife of a prominent newspaper publisher. And the two of them together were the social world, the social arbiters, the grand women of the District of Columbia during this period. And their, their letters and diaries are remarkable. To read. So her last years, she has to sell off the plantations because there's no good son or surviving son has uh, been bankrupt. He's in debtor's prison. He's, he's gambling debts. He's lost everything. And she keeps bailing him out. No tough love in that relationship. And so she comes back to Washington, D.C. and live, lives her last five years in, in sort of genteel poverty. She does. And her friends and supporters come up with discreet ways to help her. And one of the ways that she makes ends meet is she hires out Paul Jennings, who was one of the enslaved individuals that had served as James Madison's valet. And she received the wages for his labor, which she used to support herself. I want to go to one of the 10 things you you and I have compiled together on this. And it's a very disturbing one to me. She knew Sally Hemings. The Madisons came a number of times to Monticello. Sally Hemings may have come to Washington. That's disputed, but that's, uh, but she met her at certainly at Monticello. And she may or may not have known that Sally Hemings was Jefferson's mistress, his, his sexual partner, but probably, you know, the Madisons are not idiots. The house isn't that big. 
And she. And there are also children that are dead ringers for him. There, there are, of course, these doppelganger children. And <laughs> Sally Hemings is pregnant and nearing her birthing. And Dolly Madison talks her into naming the child James Madison Hemings and says that if she does name the child James Madison Hemings, she'll give her a gift. Sally Hemings does. And the boy becomes known as, as Jim Mad, you know, as a, as a nickname, James Madison. But apparently, according to family traditions and Sally Hemings indirectly, the gift was never forthcoming. This really makes my skin crawl. I don't know about you. Yeah, it's very creepy. It's uh, very manipulative. Perhaps that's a good way to enter into sort of her general relationship and views of slavery, which was one of one of our, our topics. And she's a very interesting figure because she was raised by this intensely ideologue father who believed strongly in emancipation and then was in Philadelphia, which was a city that had a very vibrant free black population and emancipation books and abolition, emancipation and abolition laws on the books. So for all intensive purposes, she should have been much more forward thinking about this subject than some of the other people that we have discussed in this time period. And instead, it seems that her childhood was incredibly disrupted. There was no stability. There was constant movement. It seemed like her father failed at business time and time and time again. It seems like he was a pretty volatile character. It seems like she really developed this need to try and have some some stability, but also then hated conflict in her life, so worked really hard to avoid it, and intentionally chose among many suitors, because when she was a widow and was choosing her second husband, there were a lot of very wealthy men asking for her hand, and she intentionally chose someone who would provide a plantation lifestyle because that was what she remembered as the most stable moment in her childhood. And interestingly, all of her sisters did the same, which I think is a very interesting note about what the women in that family were prioritizing. And this is a part of slavery that we often don't talk about because it's it does make your skin crawl, which is that it was convenient to have someone wait on you hand and foot. It was convenient to have someone do all of your laundry and all of your cooking and fetch a beverage or food whenever you needed anything, to do your hair, to take care of your clothes. And she liked being pampered. She liked being waited on. And it seems there's another incident where she had a one of her ladies maids, She her name was Suki, or they called her Suki. And she was apparently great at doing Dolly's hair. And at one point, Dolly felt like maybe Suki was stealing from her and so wanted to banish her as punishment, but gave up after a week because she liked how she did her hair so much and couldn't fathom why someone who was enslaved would be disgruntled with that position or would want to steal. And so I think that does really show the mindset of like the willingness to try and convince someone to name their child after your husband and then go back on it or, you know, to be be just totally befuddled that someone wouldn't be pleased with this status where you're, you know, ripped from your family is is callous and cruel. And it's hard, I think, to sometimes put ourselves in that particular perspective. Well, there's something so patronizing and so condescending about this, you know, that we're going to bless your child with my husband's name. You know, people want to name their own children in their own way, from their own tradition. And to have these slaveholders naming their slaves Jupiter and Zeus and Apollo and so on, or giving them the names of their friends, there's something deeply cynical about it, you know, unhuman about it. And then if she really did say, I'll give you a gift and then reneged upon it, it's a strange um, and and really um, disquieting story. And, and there's one more part to this, Lindsay, you know, Jefferson is famous for his, his dinner parties, late afternoon dinner parties at the White House. But the Madisons entertained on a much more lavish scale in much larger numbers. And I read yesterday that she occasionally would assign to every guest an African-American temporary valet. So when you come in for dinner, each of these white couples or people are assigned an enslaved person for the evening to, if you need something, if your fork needs to be uh, washed, if you if you if your wine glass is broken, you know, whatever this might, if, an er if there's an errand to be run to check on the carriage and the horses. And when you see that, you think, well, 
she didn't really imbibe her father's full sense of the incompatibility of slavery with the republic. She totally rejected it. And I think that so I just want to clarify so when when she did that 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 was for the dinners. That was not for her drawing rooms though, correct? No, this I think this were White House dinners, right? Okay. The most interesting part of this in, in terms of the, the trajectory of her life is that she is married early. That husband dies in the yellow fever epidemic, a cataclysm. She soon connects with this rising young man James Madison, obviously a deeply brilliant person, but shy and awkward and wears black and is small. She's large, tall, beautiful, elegant, wears great clothes, vivacious, some would even say flamboyant. And so you get kind of a comic picture almost of this diminutive man who um, I heard someone say the other day was the shortest president in American history, if that means anything. And she's 5'8 at least and wears turbans and ostrich feathers and so on so she towers over her her little husband well i'm not sure that's quite right so most accounts of the time say that they were the same height now she of course did have elaborate headdresses so so they certainly were of the the same stature which is i guess relatively unusual especially for presidents because as you noted we seem to like electing tall presidents whereas earlier in her life and and even i would argue when Madison was a congressman and then when they were home, she really liked nice clothes, but she didn't develop and embrace this more ostentatious persona really until she was first lady. And then it was part of crafting the social scene in Washington, D.C. and a very intentional choice. So perhaps we should talk about her her hostess skills because they were legendary and a huge asset to Madison. We will. We need to take a short break, Lindsay. We're talking with Dr. Lindsay Chervinsky, the author of a book on the cabinet and more coming, including one on John Q. Adams. Today, we're talking about 10 things about Dolly Madison. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. I'm Clay Jenkinson. I'm talking with Dr. Lindsay Chervinsky, 10 things about Dolly Madison. In the first section, we talked a little bit about her complicated relationship with slavery and some of the less desirable manifestations of that in her long and interesting life. She married a man 17 years her senior. Uh, you suggested she was, and like her sisters, looking for social status and stability above all. Madison certainly provided that they made for one of the great couples in American history. And she, in some respects, is the first real first lady in a way that Martha Washington wasn't and Abigail Adams wasn't. She took this role very seriously. But talk a little bit, Lindsay, about the relationship between James Madison and Dolly. Well, the early days of their relationship, we we have to speculate a little bit because not a whole lot of her letters and her documents survive until their marriage. But it seems like when they met in Philadelphia, she was looking for this stability. She was looking for a relationship, recognizing that whoever her next husband would be would establish her social status, which was fairly common for marriage at the time. Madison had a couple of attributes going for him. His political star was on the rise. He was widely respected as being this brilliant lawyer and politician he adored her he clearly adored her he fell hard and fast and was actually fairly romantic at a time when romance wasn't always necessarily a consideration in marriage and he knew a lot of the same people she did especially from their time in virginia and people could attest to his decent and kind character he was not a cruel man and i think that those attributes were things she was looking for he also was interesting and from what we can tell because she was a vivacious person and she valued other people in conversation I think we often dismiss that, but who really wants to have a boring spouse? And so I think we shouldn't discount that as one of the things she probably was thinking about. And then over time, from everything we can tell, it really did blossom into a really lovely, warm, loving marriage. And she, they wrote to each other when they were separate, and they're very nice letters. They're very sweet. 
She often called him my dear Jimmy. So, I mean, it was a very, it, I think it grew to be a very affectionate relationship in a way that uh, was not always a guarantee. Indeed. And he clearly understood that his own social awkwardness was complemented beautifully by her capacity to work a crowd, keep up a conversation, make sure everybody was included, you know, work the room, make everyone feel welcome, uh, make sure the conversation didn't spin out of control, draw with the ladies at the right moment, but but not to accept that as an iron code either. So I have great admiration for her in this respect. And, you know, she also, and this is a, maybe a piece of Dolly Madison trivia, but she was the first first lady to take up a cause outside of being the spouse of the executive. And so we take this for granted now. Most first ladies these days have a special interest in uh, the Special Olympics or, you know, adoption or something. And Dolly Madison took up the cause of an orphanage in Washington, D.C. And, and gave some of her energy as first lady to that. I find that really interesting. You, you're Do we a, know why? Do we know why that was her cause? I don't know why, but you're a student of the of the norms that grew out of the first presidencies. And so, you know, Martha Washington, she saw herself as the consort, really, of George Washington and behaved in a way as if she were a consort in the old tradition. That's certainly not Abigail Adams. Abigail Adams is, is, a, is a brilliant and but somewhat formidable person. It's hard to imagine her in a social setting being equal to Dolly Madison. But Dolly Madison comes along. She, this is a theme that I come back to all the time. These women in this time did not have the opportunities that are just freely available to people like you. They had to confine their mighty energies into, into a handful of socially acceptable channels. What a terrible thing. And I think of Alice Roosevelt, Roosevelt's daughter, who was every bit as brilliant as he was and had nowhere to put her mighty energies. And so she became a kind of a, a problem instead of a, an asset. And here's Dolly Madison, who clearly has a huge engine of energy, not only handling all this social life and being a, a real advisor to her husband behind the scenes, but also then taking on a, this cause of an orphanage. Well, in some ways, I think actually there were more opportunities available to Dolly than there were to Alice in kind of a an unexpected way. And that's for, for two reasons. One, the political life in Washington, D.C. at that time required these social events to get anything done because the connections, the networking, the relationships, the ties. It's, by the way, it's still how DC runs, but even more so then. And so marriages and appointments and nominations and secretaries were all se often secured by women in these places. And then the second piece is men weren't supposed to campaign. And so Dolly and Louisa Catherine Adams and the other wives at the time, they essentially were the campaign managers often for their husbands because they could put on the right social events that would draw support for their husband's campaigns or their causes or whatever it was and, you know, smooth over battles in the cabinet or smooth over tiffs with diplomatic individuals who were diplomatic envoys who were in town. And so she actually had a much larger political role than we sometimes think, because it's very easy to dismiss it as just throwing parties. And that was absolutely not what it was. It was very much this social code behind the scenes that made Washington work the way it did. Which Jefferson recognized, but he knew that he needed her. What was, as we have discussed, Jefferson wasn't always fond of women. Yes, especially strong women. So how did he get along with Dolly? You know, I think that it's a Jane Austen novel, right? I mean, exquisite politeness, appreciation, respect, respect because of his love of James Madison. I mean, the Madisons come to Monticello a lot. Oh, they have special yeah. rooms assigned to them. They almost have a special staff when they come uh, so that it's like a very tight relationship. So Jefferson would not have been able to do it with Abigail Adams, I don't think. He just wouldn't. She's too abrasive for him, too direct. She's too pointed. You know, Dolly Madison must have had exquisite manners. She did. And that, I think, made her able to. I mean, look, if you're the wife of James Madison, right? You have to think a lot of the time, 
always second fiddle to the great visionary, always the, the right hand man. You know, Madison does all this stuff and keeps Jefferson honest and prevents Jefferson from doing the craziest stuff that comes into his mind. And yet he's the junior partner and Jefferson is the great philosopher, the author. It had to bugger, no matter how much you respect Jefferson, this it had to bugger that that Jefferson was this kind of already international philosophical celebrity and her husband was this kind of more grounded sort of individual with less charisma. Yeah, I think that's probably right. So I think the best, we'll talk about books later, but I think the best biography of Dolly is by Catherine Algor called A More Perfect Union. And in it, she says that Madison had two marriages and one is to Jefferson and one is to Dolly. And I um, I think that that's just such a great way to put it because she's right. And, you know, there were two very, there were two big relationships in his life and it was Jefferson and it was Dolly. But she also says that Dolly, um, someone once said to Dolly, everyone loves Mrs. Madison. And she replied, that's because Mrs. Madison loves everyone. Um, and one of her sisters said that after a social event one day, she was describing it and she says that everyone feels better about themselves when they're with Dolly. So she was the master at making sure there wasn't conflict, which I am sure Jefferson appreciated because he hated conflict. And so I'm sure that even if she sometimes was annoyed by him, she just figured out how to ignore it or to get around it or to just make it work because it was so important. I agree, of course. But I'd just like to imagine James Madison coming home and Jefferson has just done some crazy thing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Some letter about blood and liberty. Or, you know. Inserted a clause about nullification into his resolution in Virginia. Just the, the weirder, wilder, more radical side of Jefferson and Madison coming home and saying, no, I'm going to have to spend three weeks on doing this. I'm going to have to talk him down. You know, I don't know why he does this. There had to be some of that, no matter how deep the love and respect was. Two marriages, you know, we often say, well, you your real wife and your and your work wife so his work wife to use a stupid gender term was thomas jefferson and we you know as a historian that there have been few if any partnerships of that capacity in american history certainly not sustained for that long it was a it, it's it's pretty remarkable that two such brilliant individuals could actually get along for that long. <laughs> I think that um, it re it required a very unique pairing of their relationship, and it required their their strengths and their talents suited each other so well, and their the way that they managed things suited each other so well. And so, yes, I do think it was a, a very unique pairing. Okay, next on our list. Well, since we're talking about their time in the White House, let's talk about their time in the White House. Uh, you, we both have, we we both have on our list. We put together sort of separate lists and are smooshing them together. But we both, of course, had the famous incident of the Gilbert Stuart painting of George Washington in the White House, uh, which we should note is actually a copy of the original portrait. So the original portrait. Wait, you're saying that it, that that painting was a copy of the original? Where was the original at the time? England. In England. All right. So this is the most well-known story of Dolly Madison, that when the British burned the Capitol, they burned the White House, uh, the Capitol itself, and the, and the Treasury Department, uh, and a lot of ancillary things. Um, and when they did this, Dolly Madison was not the last to leave the White House, but she was the last white person to leave the White House, an important distinction. And she was on the roof that morning with her spyglass, with her telescope, because her her husband was out trying to, to rally the troops in Maryland, uh, which is in itself a, a strange thing to imagine. But she's up on the roof looking, and then she's advised again and again, you've got to go, you've got to go, you've got to go. So she leaves most of her personal effects behind. She packs up a trunk or two. Uh, but she gathers up important government documents and gets them onto a wagon to be taken to Georgetown. And then there, everyone's like, we've got to go now. And she says, no, we're not going without the Gilbert Stewart painting. So pick up the story from there. Yes. So the Gilbert Stewart painting actually was originally, it's called, the original is called the Lansdowne portrait. And it was painted for, I think, the Earl of Lansdowne. And so the original was in England, which I believe that is now the one that is in the National Portrait Gallery, if I'm getting my provenance correct. Uh, but Gilbert Stewart made several of these paintings. And one of them was in the White House. And 
Dolly understood the symbolic value of what would happen if this painting was destroyed. And by the time she realized that they needed to get out and that she needed to get this painting, there was no time to unscrew the frame from the wall. And so she instructed several of the enslaved men who were in the house, including Paul Jennings, to basically break the frame, take out the canvas, roll it up, and then she sent it with one of the men who was there to sort of escort her. And I think he was going to New York and she sent it with him for safekeeping. But uh, she and of course, Paul Jennings and the other individuals who were there were responsible for ensuring that this painting was not destroyed. And it is in fact back in the White House now. It is one of the few paintings with a permanent location in the White House in the East Room, which is the large reception room on one side of the state floor and it hangs there and on the other side of the East Room. Well, there's there's George and there's Martha and then there's Theodore Roosevelt. Indeed, so it's a a true story. Oftentimes these stories wind up being apocryphal or mythological at some point. I did not know until yesterday that she was on the roof, which I just love. She's up on the roof of the White House and that Madison is not there and that she really did do heroic work to try to save state papers we, we attach all the symbolism to the painting, but the state papers were equally important because when the British came, well, a couple of things happened when, when, when they finally abandoned it, there was looting. Whenever there's a, a situation like this, there are looters. And these weren't British. These were Americans that were looting the Capitol, the Treasury Department and the White House and taking whatever they could get their hands on. And so her her work at this was really extraordinary here's something that i learned too and i want to get your opinion about this he had madison and she were exchanging all these notes where should we meet you know where are you safe how can we get back together and so he encouraged her to come to this tavern on the virginia side which she does but when she gets there she's browbeaten by some of the people there they're like you and your husband have really screwed this up he's a terrible president the war look at you the capital's been burned and so instead of embracing her and saying, thank goodness you're alive, which some of them I'm sure did, they're like criticizing the Madison administration. And when he came back into the city, he got it too. He's on horseback and people are like, you call yourself the president of the United States? So I didn't know that, did you? I did not know that, that's fascinating. Uh, And, you know, I can, I guess I can sort of understand from the perspective of DC residents that having an army march through the town is probably not a particularly fun experience. The army did not burn any houses that were private residences. And they actually left the patent office untouched because the person working there was able to convince them that it would be destruction of all of these inventors properties rather than the government properties. But they did burn all of the government buildings and I'm sure did some of the things that an army does when it marches through territory, uh, including seizing things and eating things and violence and you name it. So I'm sure they were not particularly happy to have this armed force in their town, although they did leave pretty quickly. But it is interesting that there was no sort of rally around the flag, so to speak. Well, she didn't have the painting with her at this point. It had gone That's on. That's true. Okay, so, so see, if she had had that, she would have been fine. She could have, she could have waved it. like. But also, really fascinating is that she there was to be a dinner party at the White House that afternoon. And there were, they had placed all this beautiful china and silverware and wine glasses and uh, they had wine in ice which is no easy thing to do uh, in the age of before refrigeration and when the british came in they saw this the 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 tables were set and so they sat down and had the meal Uh, i suppose they forced african-american enslaved people to to serve the meal and they sat down and they ate at the China and, and had the meal. And then they set the building on fire. They did. And I think, you know, one of the things that Dolly and and actually James Madison deserve credit for afterwards. So after the town was incinerated, not the entire town, the government buildings were incinerated. They elected not to go anywhere else. They were both committed to remaining in D.C. And there was at this time still some pressure from congressmen and various people to move the capital because it was still a relative podunk town compared to a Philadelphia, Charleston, New York, you name it. And so they worked quickly to do one of two things. They set up residence in the Octagon House, which is just a block away from the White House and still stands today. You can go see it. It's very cool. 
And uh, she continued to host her events and her drawing rooms, her Wednesday evening drawing rooms, to try and retain the social scene in Washington, D.C. And Madison really kept under wraps how bad the damage was to the White House. It, it basically was just a shell of a wall. Everything else was destroyed. And, it, and the plaster had to be completely redone because it had been fractured by the house was on fire and then there was a rain. And so it split all the plaster. And he kept that under wraps and convinced Congress to rebuild, but moved very quickly so that none of the sentiment about moving the city could be, could catch fire. Oh, I shouldn't say that. That was not. <laughs> that was a very unintentional pun. Unfortunate pun, but it's. It's true, and I did not know that either. That there was a there had been continual grumblings about the capital and, and desires to move it back to Philadelphia, but now they really those who wanted that agenda fulfilled went after it with real passion, and they thought this is our opportunity. The capital is spoiled, everything's burned. Let's just go back to Philadelphia, where there are amenities, where there's uh, urban protection. Uh, but the Madisons worked tirelessly to prevent that from happening, and that. That would have greatly pleased the old man of Monticello to know that they were going to keep the capital in the Upper South on the Potomac, which was one of Jefferson's deep desires. We need to take a break. We're talking with Dr. Lindsay Chervinsky, 10 Things About Dolly Madison. When we come back in a moment, I want to ask you about her relationship with her son. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to this special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. I'm Clay Jenkinson with Dr. Lindsay Trevinsky across from me, well, across the country, that is. And we're talking about Dolly Madison. You know, we've talked a little bit about her upbringing and her marriage to a man 17 years her senior, the powerful and 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 really um, harmonious marriage that it was, her work as a is not just a society hostess, but almost as a as a political, how should I put it? She's almost like a political prime minister. That's how I would think of it. Yeah, like a chief of staff in some ways, almost. We're exaggerating a little, but it was more than, I think you made the point, everyone thinks, well, she's just putting on great dinners. That's the least of it. It's it's what she does in those situations to make people feel comfortable, to help them reconcile themselves to, to Madison's politics and his policies and so on. You know, she's doing active political work on behalf of the Madison administration. But the thing that she could never get tough about, Lindsay, is the son of hers, John Payne Todd. She and Madison had no children, so who knows what that means. But she, she had children from, from previous. One of them had died in the yellow fever epidemic in 1793, and now the other son lives, and she does everything in her power to help him through life. He's just one of those wastrels who could never get it together. What do you make of this? Well, I think there were a couple of factors. One her brother, her youngest brother, was very similar, had clearly had a drinking problem, had what we suspect is a gambling problem, would often disappear for days or weeks or months at a time, was incredibly unreliable. And so it's not unusual with these family histories. I think we talked about this when we talked about Abigail Adams as well. It's not unusual for what we now know is addiction for whether it's gambling addiction or alcohol addiction to run in the family and to maybe skip a person. There's no indication that Dolly had these addictions, but to go to her son. And it seems like he, so he had some of these addictive issues. He was an alcoholic. He ran up enormous debts. Um, and, and so there's, there's the hereditary piece of it, which I think we can be sympathetic that they didn't have the same understanding about how some of these things work and there wasn't the same sort of treatment options for these types of addictions. But then there's also the social factors. And I think there are a couple that come into play here. One, she was raised that women are submissive. Women are not supposed to dominate men. Women are not supposed to tell men what to do. That was the both how she was raised as a a daughter, but also Virginia aristocratic society, very much prized submissive women. Unlike, let's say, an Abigail Adams, who is a little bit less submissive. New, New England culture prioritized that less. So it was out of, it would have been very out of character for her to try and be a strict disciplinarian with her son because that was not how she was raised to deal with boys or men. 
The second piece, I think, is there was a certain cultural element that young men, especially young aristocratic men, the sort of boys will be boys concept and the idea that they were going to do some crazy things in their youth, they were going to have some indiscretions, they were probably going to get in trouble while they were at college, they were going to spend too much money, they hopefully if they had sexual indiscretions would do so with enslaved individuals so there weren't ramifications for marriage, which sounds terrible but was definitely the way that it was thought about, and they would grow out of it, they would mature out of it. And some men just didn't. And I think that John Payne Todd was an example where he just never developed a sense of that sort of responsibility and seriousness that was expected of him. Yes, of course. Uh, well said. But normally when this happens, the young person ruins him or herself, but he dragged his mother down with him. She had to sell almost everything she owned in order to keep up with even a portion of his massive indebtedness and so it makes me feel great sadness for her you know and this must have caused some tension in the marriage too and you've got some information about that from of course washington so the stepfather situations are never easy washington's wife martha had her own previous progeny and george washington had to deal with that in addition to everything else that he had to deal with yeah, and it, it, by all accounts, James Madison really tried to be a good and decent stepfather. He tried to provide for whatever John Payne Todd needed. He tried to provide some semblance of authority, but was not super strict. I think Washington was probably a much stricter stepfather and then step grandfather. But even then, Washington failed sometimes to rein in these more out of control young men. Um, and so I do think it caused a lot of tension, especially because we know that with plantations like Montpelier or even Mount Vernon, they often were quite cash poor. They they might be land rich or resource rich, but they were they were cash poor. And so Madison often didn't have the resources to discharge the debts that Todd ran up. And so that when, when Madison did die and Dolly was left with this estate, one of the things that she chose to do to pay off these debts was one, to sell the estate, but also to sell off the enslaved individuals because they were probably the most valuable commodity that she had at her disposal to try and discharge these debts. I want to ask you now about two sort of questions that make me feel slightly squeamish. The first is about the difference in ages between these men and the women that they married. So William Clark comes back from the Lewis and Clark expedition and marries um, uh, Julia Hancock. She's 15. That means he met her when she was 11 or 12, and he carried the torch for her uh, through Montana. That wasn't the worst of it. He tried to marry Kitty Floyd, the daughter of a New York congressman. And Kitty Floyd, it, it's an impossible. You just know this isn't going to work out. You just, it's absolutely not going to work out. And she ponied him along for a while. And then she sent him a Dear John, apparently it was a very cruel Dear John letter. And she married a medical student, meanwhile. And Jefferson writes this lovely condolence letter to Madison, basically saying, there are lots of fish in the sea, kind of a letter. <laughs> anyway, she was even younger. So what do you make of this habit that continued in some Southern states up until almost our own time of these middle-aged men and older marrying girls? I mean, truly girls, not yet women. You're right, that it was very much the custom. And partly that's because of the economic considerations of what marriage was for. So women selected spouses that could provide a roof over their heads and stability and a life for their children at a time when most laws had a concept called coverture, which meant that once a woman was married, she no longer really existed as a separate legal entity. And so all of the funds, everything had to do with her husband. And so it was really essential if you, at a time before women could work, really, before there were a lot of career opportunities, you had to pick wisely. And for women who didn't pick wisely, they often ended up in very poor circumstances. On the flip side, men married women for the social benefit that Dolly provided for the political benefit, but also to have an heir. And so if you are an older man, there is a certain mathematical equation that goes along with trying to maximize your potential children, which sounds callous, but nonetheless was one of the factors. Now to Madison and Dolly's credit, she was 17 years younger, but she was not 15. 
She had already been married once. She had had two children. She was experienced in the ways of the world and had been running a boarding house before they got married. So, and I think that the difference between, you know, like 23 and 40 is different, especially if the 23-year-old woman has married before and had children, is different than, let's say, 15 and, you know, whatever. Um, so I, I'm not as creeped out by, the, by that one story. Um, and, you know, I think also in particular, at a, this is at a time when men often didn't inherit their plantation estates until their father had passed away or, or they, be, they became the caretaker of the estate as their father was older. Or in the case of like John Adams, John Adams waited to marry Abigail until his legal practice was established because he had to make sure that he could provide for a family. So that's those are some of the factors that I think explain this age difference. Falling in love with an 11 year old. We don't know that, but being uh, noticing her and keeping her in his mind over that period is a little bit hard for us to make sense of in our time. So I think of Kitty Floyd. I would just love to see that them courting i just love to see that well especially because by all intensive purposes madison was not a particularly good he's not a particularly good flirt women made him more awkward not less and you can imagine this young woman who was by all intents and purposes very charming and lovely and had other suitors this like older awkward man coming in and you know paying her attention and i don't want to put thoughts in her head but you can sort of imagine her being like what is he doing here He's obviously uh, a catch from a certain point of view. He's a prominent man. He's essential to the, the Constitution of the United States. He's, he's one of the principal authors of the Federalist Papers. He, he is the author of the Bill of Rights. He's the one who got the Virginia Statute for Religious Liberty through a reluctant House of Delegates in Virginia. He's amazing, but he isn't very immediately attractive. And the age difference is going to mean more. Second thing about the age difference may be worth saying is that if you look at the mortality, infant mortality and the mortality of, of women who, who, who give birth to children, it's huge. And so marrying a young woman, she may not be a woman in the in our sense of the maturity of a woman, but but biologically, she's in the prime of her childbearing years between, say, 14 and, and 30 and these were people that had lots of children, A, no birth control to speak of, and B, they wanted lots of children because of the infant mortality rate. It makes it a little less icky. It does. And you can see how Madison's qualities and what he had to offer to a potential spouse would be more appealing to someone like Dolly than to someone like Kitty, given that she was a little bit older, she had already lost a first husband, and there is evidence to suggest, at least based on her correspondence, that she was fairly well-educated. The way that she writes is fairly eloquent, and so perhaps she would have appreciated those things that he brought to the table more than Kitty did. Okay, now this one, and I apologize in advance for asking you, but I was reading this biography of them, a joint biography of, of Dolly and James Madison, and there's this talk about these extremely low-cut dresses that women wore during this period, and they were so low-cut that they had to wear scarves to, to cover their breasts. Otherwise, they were more or less completely exposed. What's that about? How about just higher necklines? <laughs> well, so for anyone, I, I really encourage listeners to to Google some of this stuff, because if you look at the neckline, it wasn't like we would think of today as a V neckline. It was a sort of a scoop, like a U. And women didn't have bras like they do today. So you had a series of things that sort of, you had a, a series of underlayers and you had a girdle, but you weren't closed in like you would be today and so, cover. <laughs> yeah so so these necklines were sort of a scoop low and the idea was to show the entire top of your decolletage or your bosom as they refer to it and um then you would put you would tuck the the handkerchief sort of down in the center of it to cover up the cleavage at the center which whatever. Um, at the time, the dress lines also were what were considered a Grecian style. So I'm, I'm not sure what how, what this is going to mean to everyone, but it's an empire style waist, which means the waistline is, is you know, sort of up on your rib cage. It's a straight down silhouette. So it's not like the big hoop skirts we would think of when we think of like Mary Lincoln or the Civil War era. And it's also not necessarily this the larger skirt that you saw a slightly larger skirt that you saw earlier in the colonial period. So depending on how much fabric you use on a dress, 
for an empire style dress, it can be very clingy and especially the type of fabric, how many layers you have. And so some of the more spectacularly scandalous individuals at the time would wear very thin, like almost uh, like muslin style dresses with very few layers underneath, which leaves not a whole lot to the imagination, not in terms of like see-through, but in terms of shape. And so there was definitely a, a little bit of, you know, scandal involved with this. However, I would say their version of like a woman being, you know, there are these descriptions of someone being like almost naked in, in public. If we saw this dress, we would not consider it to be naked. And people go out in far fewer clothes today. It must have been fashionable to have yeah. cleavage, to show cleavage, because they did. It wasn't so much cleavage. I'm really going to dig into the terms here. It's to show the, I'm going to try and do this in the most scientific terminology possible, to show the uh, top slope of one's breast. And the idea was to show that you had an ample bosom and that would therefore bring with it the, the connotations of maternal splendor. Give me a sense of what do you make of her as a, as a human being? We know she was a helpmeet in a really important sense. She gave her life, as many would in that era, and to the success of her husband's career. She had her own personality. She was a, the biggest female personality in the White House, at least until Mary Todd Lincoln. She's the first of the great first ladies in American history. She had great compassion, seemed to really have strong sentiments for the have-nots, although it ended on the race line, perhaps. What do you what do you make of her as a human being? I mean, we kind of lock her into this myth of the first lady. She had been, of course, raised Quaker and was read out of the community. And so for all intents and purposes, was sort of Anglican with Madison by the time they were married. There was probably an element of religion in their lives as it was sort of customary at the time. But people that lived in D.C. in the early 1800s, 1810, said that religion wasn't a particularly big factor as a part of the social fabric. There were services that were often read in the capital, but it wasn't like a very integral part of society. I think the overwhelming characteristic that would have come out if you met her was that she was wildly charismatic. She was a powerful force not in a domineering sort of way, but that you couldn't help but notice her. You couldn't help by be impressed by her. You couldn't help by feel the strength of her vibrancy as a person. From what we can tell, she actually was, towards most people, was very warm, was interested in helping people, wanted to make their lives better, wanted to help them with whatever it was that was troubling them, whether it was a family member or a relationship or work. She went out of her way to make connections, to help people with positions, to facilitate facilitate agreements to, I mean, you name it, she was constantly trying to help people and make their lives better. And she was adored for it. And, um, you know, she was often called the queen of hearts during her reign as first lady. And it wasn't sarcastic. It was really intentional and, and well meant. And so I think that as long as you were white and you met her, you would have liked her because almost everyone did. She has a glaring hole when it comes to race and slavery in that that kindness and that warmth and that help stopped. And it's hard to explain how someone who noticed everything and noticed everyone and went out of her way, she apparently never forgot a face, she never forgot a name, she was incredibly observant, could be so totally blind to how cruel that part of her life was. Yeah, hard to understand. You know, So maybe she felt that her father had done an economically silly thing by emancipating his own enslaved people maybe she just accepted the what she took to be the norms of her time uh, and with with their strong sense of race hierarchy but it does it leaves a slightly jarring note you would have expected her to be more of an abolitionist given her upbringing and and her intelligence or even like even if not an abolitionist just even a little bit more feeling towards the people around her and i It's hard not to come away with the sense that she just like didn't have any feeling towards them. I think that says a lot about that era. We got to let it go with that. I'll add two more that we won't discuss. Um, Hillary Rodham Clinton, of course, and uh, Rosalind Carter, both very strong first ladies, both controversial for being strong. We'll leave it at that for the moment. Thank you, Dr. Lindsay Chervinsky, this special edition of 10 Things About Dolly Madison. Thanks to all of you. We'll see you all next week for another important edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour.
The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. Bach Cello Suite Number no. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program.